Well, hello there. Welcome, welcome. Please come in. I know this might not be what you were expecting, but you and I... We're going to go on so many adventures. We're going to have so much fun. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, the show that's here to show you the most jaw dropping, heart stopping, mind bending theories you can imagine. In case you missed our last theory on the amazing digital circus, the long and short of it is that we believe that the circus here isn't exactly what it appears to be. Instead of some futuristic, fully immersive experience, we believe that it's actually a VR video game from the 1990s, one that copies the brains of anyone who puts on the headset. It then turns that copy into a digital character to go on adventures throughout the circus. So the people trapped in this world looking for an exit, they're not actually people, just digital copies of their consciousnesses, their personalities. That's why we repeatedly see workstations of VR headsets in the first episode, but with no one actually wearing the headsets. And our theories didn't stop there. We continued by saying that Pomni is either the creator of the game or an employee at the development studio making the game, as evidenced by our mental breakdown when seeing those work desks. And while this is the direction that I still believe the series is headed for, how about we talk about something else? You see, there's still a ton to dig into here with the digital circus. Well, sure, those initial theories are the ones that I think are the most likely and the most intentional. It's once to stretch a bit further out that some of the truly fun, wacky ideas really start to develop. Are they right? Yeah, probably not. Are they interesting and fun? Absolutely. And therein lies the beauty of theory crafting. For example, last time I briefly tossed out a bit of wild speculation that the digital circus may have itself some biblical connections. In this brief scene exploring the back rooms of the company who seemingly created the circus, we see the initials C and A painted onto the wall. C made me immediately connect things back to our lovable AI ringleader Kane, a guy who's probably the most in control of this entire situation. And if you tend to see the name Kane partnered with the initial A in any sort of pop cultural reference, the first immediate jump is going to be to the biblical story of Cain and Abel. See, Cain and Abel were the children of Adam and Eve, the first humans to ever exist in the Abrahamic religions. At the time, I wasn't really sure if this was meant to be anything or if it was going to lead anywhere, but the more I sat and thought about it, the more connections that I started to make. Some of those connections were admittedly very dumb. For example, in biblical canon, Cain kills Abel and becomes the first murderer. And what does Cain do multiple times throughout the pilot? He pops bubble for comedic effect. Ow! You parasite! Cain kills a bubble. A bull. Coincidence? Absolutely yes. It is single-handedly one of the dumbest things I've ever said in a theory, and I have said a lot of dumb things in theories. But other parallels that I found as I was doing this little brain search through the episode again were a lot more compelling. In fact, some connections were so large that I believe I may have just cracked the question of what the digital circus is wide open. You see, loyal theorists, the amazing digital circus isn't just some mere video game that's trapped these consciousnesses. No. It's something much darker. It's an eternity of torment and torture. The amazing digital circus is, quite literally, hell. Put on your headsets and get your randomly generated names, my friends. We're going in. So the claim that the digital circus is literally hell is a pretty bold one. So why would I possibly make it? Well, look at this. At the very end of the pilot, here we're shown all the human characters sitting at a table while eating food. But you notice anything weird about their dining arrangement? Of all the ways they could have set up this table, they decided to have every character on just one side, all of them facing the same direction, out at us, the audience. When this is done in fiction, it's rarely by mistake, because this right here, this is a very iconic framing device from one of the most famous paintings ever made, The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. This depicts the final meal of Jesus and his followers shared before his crucifixion. It's been the backbone of conspiracy theories and Dan Brown novels for centuries. Gooseworks, creator of the series, and all the other creatives over at Glitch, they're smart people. They wouldn't be using this imagery without understanding the historical baggage that comes along with it. And it's not just the table layout that's worth calling out here. Look at Pomni in the center, the exact position that Jesus is in for the painting. And notice the colors of Pomni, red and blue. Wouldn't it be weird if, oh wait, never mind, Jesus is also dressed in red and blue. The interpretation of his colors is that the blue represents the divine half of God, heaven, and his red represents the blood, mankind. So in Jesus, you have the mixing of these two elements, a God born amongst men and set to live as a human, red plus blue. And in Pomni, we actually have something similar, at least if our earlier theories were correct. A creator of this game, a god of this world, if you will, now set to live as a part of their own creation. And it's not like religion is completely absent from this world either. Quite the contrary. We know for a fact that God exists in the
the circus in some form or another. During the first adventure that Keen sets up for Pomni, the Gloink Queen says this. I am Gloink. Soon will be Gloink. God will be Gloink. What an oddly specific thing to say. Speaking of making oddly specific references that we can build off of, let's talk about abstraction. According to the show, when you obsess over being trapped in the circus and drive yourself crazy looking for a way out, eventually you get to asking what the point of anything is, and you completely lose sight of who you are and why you're even alive, and when you reach your breaking point, something really terrible can happen. This is known as abstraction, and we see the results of it when we meet Kofmo the Clown, or at least what's left of him. Oh! Kofmo's been obstructed! Last time, I wasn't really sure if we had enough to really make a judgment over what was happening here, but I did find some more information when digging through the creator Gooseworks' Tumblr. According to her, abstracting isn't just going crazy and becoming a big scary monster. It's definitely part of it for sure, but there is a deeper meaning. According to Gooseworks, when you abstract, you lose everything about yourself. You're stripped of every single scrap of individuality that you become something unrecognizable. All abstracted people look the same. This glitchy four-legged monster covered in eyeballs. And perhaps most importantly, abstraction cannot be undone. Now, looking back over the series with this new lens of religious imagery, the abstracted start resembling something else. Something beyond just monsters. They almost look like angels. Well, not really angels, more biblically accurate angels, which, ironically enough, doesn't really come from the Bible. Let me explain, it's kind of confusing. Three years ago, a meme started spreading across the internet featuring these monstrous multi-eyed creations. They were called biblically accurate angels. Now, you might look at these things and go, Really? They don't exactly look like the traditional image of an angel with robes and wings and halos and all that. But what they're riffing on here is a very specific part of the Bible. A few chapters in the book of Ezekiel where he describes having visions of winged creatures with four faces. Some human, some animal, and these creatures were joined by wheels within wheels with eyes. Here's a version of the quote. I looked and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, and their wings, were completely full of eyes eyes, as were their four wheels. Now, for the sake of clarity, the wheels with eyes, or ophanim, both are and aren't considered angels, depending on what documents you're using and how you're classifying things. And again, all of this is based on a few very short lines in a very long, very ancient religious tradition, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that these religious entities are always described as having an abnormal number of eyes all over their bodies, just like the abstracted that we're seeing in Digital Circus. The weird descriptions even fit with the name Abstraction. These so-called biblically accurate angels are weird, almost completely unrecognizable to humans because we can't comprehend what we're witnessing. They're unknowable. In other words, they're abstract. Now, while it's never made clear why these biblical creatures would have so many eyes, one persistent idea is that the design represents God's watchful eye over us. They're always watching us because God knows all. He sees all. Look again at the digital circus. There's a ton of eyeball imagery here. All throughout this first episode, eyes are hidden in the intro, they're hidden in paintings, they're hidden in the background. Kane even admits that he wants all the cast to stay in the circus. Where I can keep my hundreds of all-seeing eyes on you. Kane, an omniscient character who knows everything. A god of sorts. And what's he made of? Basically a mouth and two big ol' eyes. Oh, and looking at Kane's dialogue through this more religious lens makes this line hit a whole lot different. Do you like adventure? Activity? Wonder? Danger? Or pain? Suffering? Any death? Disease? Death? Angel food cake? Ow! Not only does suffering, agony, and death all sound very hellish, but why angel food cake? Like, why call out that specific type of cake here? Again, we have ourselves a weird connection to angels and religion that comes seemingly out of nowhere. But the most most compelling reason for why we can draw parallels between this series and all these religious ideas has to be the way that the creator Gooseworks talks about the digital circus. When asked if anyone in the series would be killed, Gooseworks answered that it depends on your definition of kill, which is likely pointing to the idea of abstraction. But it's interesting that she makes this distinction. It means that none of these characters can die, so to speak. They're trapped in here forever in eternal torment, just like hell. Gooseworks also talks about how characters deserve to be there, specifically calling out Jax as the one who deserves to be there the most. Using the phrase deserves to be there, it shows that the circus is some place of judgment. It's either a reward for those who are good or a punishment for those who are evil. And considering Gooseworks has a lot of negative
positive things to say about Jax, this ain't your reward day at the spa. Time and time again, Gooseworks has gone on the record to say how awful Jax is. According to Gooseworks, Jax is morally the worst character in the show, so much so that when asked if he was more of a jerk or an anti-hero, she explained that, quote, there's absolutely nothing heroic about Jax. Those are some pretty strong words for a character that you yourself created. When another fan commented that they hoped Jax was gonna get worse, Gooseworks said, you're probably gonna enjoy some of the things we have planned. And already the behavior that we've seen from him throughout the series is pretty awful. He's mean, he trips people, he knocks them over, he steps on one of Gangle's masks without Karen, he knows that Ragatha's deepest fear is centipedes, and he uses that information to torture her. By the way, I may have left something in your room today, so let me know if you find it. Uh, you're not afraid of centipedes, are you? Jax! That's literally my only fear. Why would you do this? Jax is clearly not a good person. So if Gooseworks is saying that he deserves to be in the circus more than most, then it clearly implies that we're trapped in hell. But just because they're in hell doesn't necessarily mean it has to be your typical fire and brimstone hell. Case in point, one of the most influential depictions of hell comes from a play by French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, known as We Clos, or translated into English, No Exit. In it, three people condemned to hell are brought into the same room and locked inside, but instead of a torture chamber, they just find a comfortably furnished room. Not exactly what you'd expect, right? But, as these three start talking and getting to know each other, they realize they don't click. They annoy each other, they push each other's buttons, and they twist the knife, until one of them realizes this is the torture. A famous line from the play reads, hell is other people. That sounds exactly like what we see here in the digital circus. It's six people who don't necessarily click with one another, and no matter how polite they are, they all still push each other's buttons. They exploit each other's fears and fake laugh at each other's jokes. But the worst part of all, there's no exit. Trapped in a digital room with no escape. But now to the big question. What's the point? It's all interesting for sure, but why bring up all these parallels? Well, if we can point to all these religious ideas to show what the digital circus is and how they're going to be using it in the story, we can also use them to point to where the story is headed. Specifically, I believe that we can use the religious imagery to get a pretty good idea of what Pomni's story arc is going to be. You see, Pomni is Digital Circus's parallel to Jesus Christ. I know that sounds insane. Sounds crazy enough for one of those MatPat out of context compilations that I see floating around. But the connections are there when you actually stop and look at them. I mean, think back to what I pointed out earlier about the Last Supper scene. Pomni is framed as the one in the center, exactly where Jesus is sitting in the painting. Her color scheme matches Jesus's. His robes are split between two colors, red and blue, just like Pomni's jester outfit. Additionally, we have to consider Pomni's hand. About halfway through the episode when the abstracted Kaufmo attacks Ragatha and makes her glitch, Pomni tries to help her and gets her hand glitched in the process. This plot line is actually left unresolved at the end of the episode, with Kane fixing Ragatha, but not Pomni, who keeps the glitching hand a secret. In Christianity, wounds or scars on your hand like this usually reference a very specific thing, stigmata. These are representative of the wounds that Jesus got when he was being hammered onto the cross, usually depicted as scars on your hands. Another connection to Pomni. And if our previous theory is correct and Pomni's human persona is an employee of the company behind the digital circus, well, she's the developer of this game. That would make her the creator. And just like Jesus is an aspect of God in many sects of Christianity, that would make Pomni an aspect of a God or creator of this world. Heck, her arc in the very first episode, forgetting who she is so that the information can be dramatically revealed to her later on, it even follows what Jesus went through in biblical texts, beginning life as a human before having to discover for himself that he is in fact the son of God, discovering his purpose to save humanity from themselves. And this is why I think we have to care about all this. Why we started looking at all these religious parallels in the first place. If the digital circus is indeed designed to be hell, and everyone here is condemned to be there in some way, and Pomni suddenly comes in as a representative of Jesus, well, she's there to save them. To help the other cast members escape from this torment that they found themselves in, in Pomni's creation. But in the cruelest twist of fate, saving them is gonna doom Pomni. If I was a betting man, I'd say that Pomni will be the only one left in the digital circus after she's helped all the others to escape. Just like Jesus sacrificed himself for humanity, Pomni is gonna do the same thing here. She's gonna get left behind, forever tortured by this wacky AI going on his silly adventures. But it'll have been worth it because she'll manage to save everyone else. But hey, though the cast of the amazing digital circus might be being burned by their experience on the computer, you don't have to be thanks to our sponsor for today's video, Opera. Ever since Opera first approached us, I've been really impressed with how much they've packed into their browsers, including their latest. One of the big feature upgrades though in this new Opera browser is Lucid Mode, which instantly 
instantly sharpens any online video with just the click of a button. Listen friends, not all of the YouTube series out there are as crisp as the 1440p goodness of the amazing digital circus. Sometimes you're dealing with blurry footage shot in a potato cam from 1976. But with Opera, you can actually turn on Lucid Mode, which will help you increase the sharpness of the video in real time. No joke, this is an actual feature in this thing. There are even different levels of enhancements that you can select. You can check what the video looks like beforehand and after right there on the screen. So if something just needs a little tweak to look perfect, Lucid Mode can do that. But if it needs some heavy lifting, well, Lucid Mode can do that too. All so you don't miss a single detail hidden in the background of these videos. You know me, I'm all about efficiency, and that is the name of the game when you're talking about the Opera browser. They have a free VPN and an ad blocker integrated right into this thing, so you can protect your privacy and security while venturing out into the void without needing to download any extra extensions. Plus, the Opera sidebar has buttons for everything, from Facebook Messenger to Spotify to WhatsApp and beyond, and it's all built right in. That way you don't need to switch windows to change what you're listening to, or to message your friends. The real game changer for me though, and I've mentioned this one before, has got to be Tab Islands. As someone who just does a lot of research for their job, I can often have hundreds of tabs open across everything. It used to be a nightmare having to navigate across all those tabs, but the Opera browser makes it so much easier thanks to the Tab Islands. Basically, you can assign tabs into different groups in the same window and drag and drop tabs between them. Each group also has itself a unique color, that way you know exactly what you're looking at. Here are the dozens of Tumblr asks that I have open in blue, all the references to the Bible in red, 90s game factoids in yellow. You can even collapse the island so you don't have a billion little website icons all littering up the top of your browser. Real talk, this might be the single best internet feature to ever come about since bookmarking. So if you want to upgrade the way that you browse the web, check out Opera by using my link below and downloading the Opera browser today. Thanks again to Opera for sponsoring today's video, and as always, my friends, remember, it's all just a theory. A film theory! And cut!